So hello folks at home and welcome to A Fact Fiend Focus. It's been a hot minute. Uh, I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, for this particular episode. And I'm joined off camera and off screen, at least for me, by Lucas Holland. Hello there. And Brad Rawlinson. And we also have uh, video footage of Nisha, who is currently in America living her best life while we sit here and record this. Ah, so what is a fact theme focus? Well, a fact theme focus initially on the channel was just a chance for us to talk about things that we were interested in that weren't necessarily, um, uh, you know, structured. It was like, you know, an unstructured conversation about something we just felt a particular affinity for. So we thought we'd bring back fact theme focuses um, uh, with a, a slight twist. That twist being that the topic we're going to talk about is decided by our Patreons over on Pa no, our patrons <laughs> over on Patreon. <laughs> you were doing it's so such an well. awkward thing to say. And the topic that they've chosen was one that I suggested, hence why I'm leading this conversation. And that was strange or obscure media um, from your childhood that informed your personality. It was largely inspired by um, a thought I had, because I saw someone talking online about the idea of um, your favorite Disney film, like for kids today, is usually just like Frozen or whichever one was like the biggest one when they were growing up. But for people our age, like you know, like millennials, like you know, 25 to 35, our favorite Disney movie or animated movie is not the one that was the biggest at the time. It's probably the one that we had on VHS. And the one we had on VHS could have been a really obscure one or one that's like, you know, not as popular or well received today. People in the modern age, they don't get that. Gen Z, Zoomers, they don't have this because they grew up with Netflix. So they don't have to just sit and watch what they have. They have basically, there's a buffet. And like, you know, like video games are like a good example of this of, like my first video game console was an Atari 2600 because we just got one because a family member didn't want it anymore because they got a Nintendo. So we had an Atari and then we got a Nintendo when they got a PlayStation. And then the Nintendo we had just came with the games that they had. And I had to play those games. Yeah, it was like the first game I, I ever played was, or I have memory playing, Super Mario All-Stars on the SNES. And the SNES was just, oh, my auntie had had it for a couple of years. And because then, like, you know, my dad had kids old enough to play it, she lent it to us for, like, you know, a few months or whatever. And then eventually we ended up getting an N64 for ourselves and passed it back over to them. But, yeah, it was like, literally, we had... Super Mario All Stars, and I think maybe like Bubsy on there, and no, obviously we never touched Bubsy because fuck that game. And of course, like Mario is a very popular game, still I like, you know talked about to this day. But the idea is that that was the only game you had. That could have very well been like one of the games that I've brought today, which I never hear anybody talking about. But to me, when I sit, I go, oh, it's that game, and that's the idea of today. Of like, just let us know in the comments like your bit of media that applies to this, and don't just say it's like fucking Power Rangers. I like, don't like, like actually really go into the back of your, like scrape the back of your mind, like go back to your childhood and think of those deep, deep pulls of like that thing that you were obsessed with as a kid that like you still have nostalgia for, despite nobody ever talking about it today. I think I, I would accept people saying something that's popular if it's like one episode, because like, for example, yeah. the Goosebumps series is fairly popular, but there's two episodes of that I've seen infinitely more than the rest because we had them on VHS, and it was like a two-pack that, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Like, yeah. I have, like, Goosebumps books I had as a kid. Like, that's a good example of that, but it's only popular. Like, I think Monster Blood 4 is my favourite Goosebumps <laughs> oh, book. Oh, because it had because the we just had, front of the book. We, the we, we just, the, the little blue monster, <laughs> yeah. we just had Monster Blood 4. So I read that over and over again. So Monster Blood, so yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a, that's a good like, caveat of, if you're going to pick something popular, it has to be one very specific thing from within that popular thing that you were just obsessed with through, for some reason. Well, yeah, hopefully that like you know gives people just a good like grounding on what we try to talk about because just just don't say something popular for because I, I think I've talked before about the idea of the Reddit answer where it's when you ask people a question and they don't give you the answer they actually want to give you they give you the answer they think other people want to see so they get upvotes or likes on YouTube or more feedback because that's more important to them than actually expressing themselves. So I, I ask people, don't just say the thing you think we want to hear. It's actually just think, like, you know, go back in your mind, get that deep pull out and think of the thing that you actually were obsessed with as a kid that when you think about it, did inform your personality to this day. And I guess, getting to some examples, should I lead or do one of you guys want to lead? I think you should lead it to your, uh, I think, mm -hmm. I said before this, if we all pick two examples, so I guess if you want to lead with your first one. 
Okay, so I just picked a couple of video games. So my first example is just a few video games. And like, you know, I'm gonna, that thing I mentioned earlier of just when I was a kid, we had an Atari 2600. I don't really remember that much. That was more for my older brother. Like, I remember it being there in the cupboard, but the first console I remember was our Super Nintendo. And our Super Nintendo came, and you can see them behind me on the shelf, if I just go like that, that's all my Super Nintendo games. We never bought one. We were never given them as gifts. They were just what we had when we got it, and just like we would swap with friends who also had a Super Nintendo. But the game I want to pick is this. People might not be able to see it, but this is Pop and Twin B. I don't know what it is, but it's just some weird on-rails like shooter where you play as just two anime characters in like little bubble um, uh, ships. Just we had that game. I have never known what it is. Presumably, it's like a series or a franchise in Japan. We just ended up with that game, and me and, and it was the only two-player game we had. So me and my little brother would just play that game over and over and over again. And the reason I think that it informed my personality to this day is because a system in that game that I still remember is you get power-ups. You get power-ups, you know, Gradius, that sort of thing, you get your power-ups. It's like if people are wondering what kind of game it is, think Gradius. And the reason I think it informed my personality is because you get upgrades, like you do. But those upgrades can stack in weird ways. Like you can get a shield, or you can get different bullets. And just something me and my little brother would do is just go through the game trying to like the first level basically where you get all the power-ups because the way you get power-ups is like the little bells come out of clouds i don't know why i don't remember this but you'd shoot the bells and they change color and there's like eight different colors and each one gives you a different upgrade and me and my brother would like try and figure out what was the best most broken combination and now i think about it, it's like that's all i do in every video game every video game i play i'm always like what's the most broken op shit i can find like what's the weirdest combination i can find? what does the game not want me to combine and if I combine them in that way, can it still be useful? Yeah, I remember like that so much. And just going through that first level over and over and over again. Just repeatedly trying to see like what combinations of stuff I can do. What can I get the game to do that it doesn't want me to do? And that's just the thing. And like the other games that I thought I'd mention, because these are the ones I ended up with. Um, they're probably, they're based on popular franchises, but the games themselves don't really get talked about much. The first is Die Hard Trilogy. And then ironically enough, Alien Trilogy. And I just like, I remember I played this game before I knew what Die Hard was. I played this game before I knew what Alien was. But I became obsessed with like the imagery of the aliens, which I, I think, you know, is for my personality to this day of like, I adore like, the aesthetic of the alien and the work of like H.R. Giger. And then just Die Hard, just the idea of dumb action games where things blow up. And if I had access to it, the other game that I would have picked would have been Apocalypse. And I picked the Die Hard one because it stars Bruce Willis. And that we've talked about before, haven't we, Brad? Apocalypse is this obscure PS1 game starring Bruce Willis. And I had no idea who the fuck Bruce Willis was. But again, a system in that game is, is that you can pick up various weapons and combine them in interesting ways. And I used to love playing that game and try to figure out the interesting ways you combine the weapons. And I just think... Thinking back, like, yeah, that's me in every game, like Monster Hunter. We got my Switch behind me, my Monster Hunter. I've played hundreds of hours of that, just finding unique and interesting builds. I played hundreds of hours of, like, Halo, trying to figure out ways to make the plasma pistol work as, like, a primary weapon. I've played hundreds of hours of, like, RPGs and stuff going through, trying to do stupid min max builds in, like, ways that the game doesn't intend. The way that we uh, consume any kind of game now is always influenced by those childhood memories of playing those games i like recently i've obviously it, everyone knows i'm fairly competitive and now i think back to my childhood it's like it's because i had a brother who's two years older than me and we all we own the same consoles and the same games and we used to compete and the games like columns when we first got columns we would spend hours playing columns against each other and then i think we played mean bean machine at one point we played red faction too and it's like those games are the ones where you it's like because it's all you've got so you just spend you spend days and weeks and months playing the same game, and you get very competitive with it. I think a point of like it's worth making is like you know back when we were growing up, you didn't have the option to just play another game. No, like there media, was no game pass. No, media is so much more disposable now, and I think that's to the benefit of the consumer. Of like you don't what we said we grew up we had five channels. Like I remember channel five coming on the air. That's how old I am. I remember, and my I remember my parents having a party. When Channel 5 launched, we had five channels. You know, obviously we had like one one avenue to get more games. 
was like rental stores. I remember that as well, like renting a game. You get it and your parents are like, well, that's the only one you've got for a week. And you want to play as much of it as you can. So I also ended up with that game called Spider. Do you remember Spider? No. Which is a game where you play... It's a 2D scrolling game where you play as a spider that is genetically engineered and can pick up guns and weaponry. <laughs> I remember playing the shit... And no one ever talks about Spider. No one ever talks about bringing Spider back. Again, like, it's to the benefit of the consumer that like media is so much more disposable now. Like, you can just... If you don't like something, you can just go get another one. Like, if you don't like watching something on Netflix, you can just turn it off and watch something else. Like, if I was a kid and they asked me, do you want to just watch five channels or do you want Netflix? I'd pick Netflix. But as an adult looking back and thinking like, well, the not having access to so much media and just having to just make do with what I had did make me, oh, it did give me these like weird well, Don't pretend interests. like it's a better, a better way of viewing. I'm not going to be that dickhead that things were better back in my day. They absolutely weren't. But I still think it's interesting to discuss how. Just, I have a weird nostalgia for stuff that would be by all modern metrics. Pretty bad. I mentioned like, you know, three or four games there that I, I was obsessed with, played endlessly as a kid. And you too, like, you play a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. You'd never heard of them. And that's, a, that's fascinating to me. The idea that something that's so integral to my childhood, memories of playing video games. One of the things that made me fall in love with the media people just don't know you and i have our own little bonding moment when we discover we both played nightmare creatures getting rawr <laughs> i don't even play nightmare creatures i played the demo yeah we, over we and over and over, over again so much we got it bought for us so we, i didn't know what the game was until years <laughs> later when i saw it on your shelf and went hang on a second booed up the first mission rawr. ignatius rawr, i didn't stick. even know there was a second character because the demo only let you play as ignatius I think anyone who plays games nowadays, like obviously a lot of them are bought digitally. When you buy the cases, you get the disc and mm -hmm. nothing else. People, I, I, know, I know people always get nostalgic for the the, the booklets. I'm yeah, I was I was about up. to say like because I I just got um, from the shelf. This is obviously OG Metal Gear Solid. The, on PS4. Oh god, that's so good. Yeah, that booklet What's is amazing. Game? So this is a great example because it's got the booklet and it's got the de a demo disc for Silent Hill in it. Yep. So you used oh, to get I was that. thinking, I was like, why have you got the wrong disc in the wrong case? Yeah, but, but, like, but then this is also a two-disc game. We, we sound like boomers saying, I miss physical media. And like, that's the thing, I'm, I'm one of those people who is really just not liking the idea of all digital consoles coming through. And it's not just because of nostalgia, because, you know, I don't really enjoy the purchase of physical games anymore. I like the idea of, like, having them for preservation's sake, but... Most of them require day one updates, and a lot of them don't come with anything anymore. But it's just like I, I really hate the idea that just at one point with all digital consoles, everything you own is just going to be like, no, fuck you, it's gone. Yeah, and like that's so bad. Showing off like the strike. I know that's like a very popular game, but so the fact that the thing you can't you can look at stuff online, you had to buy strategy guides to know everything about a game. While like, Metal Gear is a popular game, sure, but the example of just the booklet, it helps you form an attachment to it because you have something in your hands. It's like, I'm sure we all remember like spending our birthday money on something oh, and going yeah. back in the car with it in your hand, just waiting to get home. And, that, and it gives you like, you know, it, you, it just, that gives you that sense of attachment. And I remember that so much as a kid of like when my uncle would like give me a game and I'd be like, this is a new game. It's not new, obviously it wasn't new, it's like, you know, it's five fucking years old, but for me, it's brand new, it's a new experience, this is mine. But the second thing I want to bring up, just very briefly, just put clips in, is a show that I'd never heard anyone ever talk about, I never hear it discussed, and, which is weird to me, looking back at it, because I think it is very impressive for what it is, and that is the show Trapdoor. And I've mentioned this on the channel before, and Trapdoor, which you had on VHS, which we just, me and my brother would watch before we'd go to bed. And it is a claymation show about a big blue monster who lives in a castle. And the castle is full of monsters and various shenanigans and adventures ensue. And the reason I think it's it should be mentioned more is because claymation is kind of like a British thing, right? It's like it's a Wallace and Gromit, Morph. Like just Aardman animation in general is like such a beloved staple of British culture. But I never hear anyone talk about Trapdoor. And it was really impressive claymation. And I think... Just watching that as a kid made me really interested in the idea of practical effects. Because you can like draw a direct through line in my mind from that to me being obsessed with like the thing. Of like someone actually had to tactilely interact with this piece of clay and they turned it into movement. 
there we go. But you know, I think that's my two. Just and just to like, you know to reiterate, like you know, just weird video games that are obscure that I played the shit out of. I think like really basically unlock that part of my brain that really enjoys trying to break down media and like the things that I consume to see like the the limits of what they'll allow me to do and then the trap door, which I think just introduced me to the idea of practical effects and like the idea that like you know things can be created just with the hands that can like look like something else that's that's my two so uh lucas brad i don't think there were many things that like really stuck with me that i was at least trying to go back and look at last night to kind of give myself an idea of what to talk about today like i don't think there's that many things because i was very much like a cartoon network slash disney channel kid Maybe, like, you know, ITV in the morning watching all, like, the Fox Kids stuff as well, like, uh, the United X-Men. I couldn't really find many things that were really obscure that I gave a shit about. But, like, I do have a couple of examples, but also I wanted to, like, open my part of the discussion with the weird sensation of realising that something that was really obscure within, like, your bubble as a child is actually not very obscure. Okay, so, so the opposite. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, to me, when I was a kid, I watched a lot of, like, Toonami and the anime and stuff. But to me, I was watching, like, the, the four kids dub of, like, One Piece and Yu-Gi-Oh! And a lot of Dragon Ball dub. I didn't find anybody else that watched it. Like, ever. And it was this really weird feeling for me. Growing up and having this, like, defining thing to me. That you think is like, oh, only I like this. Only I, like, I've never met anybody else that watches this stuff. Yu-Gi-Oh! not quite so much because, like, the, the card game itself exploded. But, like, One Piece and Dragon Ball, it took me until I was, like, 14 to find anybody else that had watched it around where I lived. And then realising when you grow a little bit older that actually is super mainstream and popular and, like, that kind of moment of having that completely reframed in your head of like oh i thought this was something like really niche and it turns out that actually it's super mainstream i had a lot of that when i was a kid because obviously um being from a family that wasn't massively well off you only had like in terms of video games we talked about before you had one console so if other people didn't have that console then what you had felt obscure to them if it was an exclusive game like Metal Gear Solid, Silent Hill, uh, Soul Reaver, like those games um, were the ones that I had. And then my friends had Nintendo consoles. They had like Zelda, they had um, Mario. And I, I hadn't played, I, I never played Zelda or Mario games till I was an adult because I never had those consoles. And it was that weird experience of um, we recently put out a video of us going through uh, Mario Party Superstars playing a game of that on the side channel. And it was like, Oh yeah, okay, sat down. So we've all played Mario Party before, right? And you and Nisha being like, no. I think we've played it once at uni with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I will continue to, you know, reinforce the Mario Party in every part of my life, but just the idea that I'm like, yeah, I, I played Mario Party since Mario Party 1 with my siblings. Like, of course, everyone's played Mario Party a hundred times. It's like, no. But yeah, that's an interesting take on it of... Uh... Stuff that you thought was obscure that ended up not being as obscure as you thought it was. Is there any uh, other examples of that then? Well, uh, like there's a couple of actually like a bit more obscure things. Um, I've kind of gone from I'm starting with most mainstream example and going down, but like, yeah, it's just that complete reframe of like, what do you mean that other people know what Dragon Ball are? <laughs> and it just broke my brain for a yeah, minute because you thought you were so special for liking it, and then yeah. just some people never grow out of that. They never. <laughs> got over the feeling of superiority from thinking they're the only person who enjoys something. There's a show that I'm pretty sure that I know Carl's watched that just, like, out of all of the ones I was looking up, I think this is one of the ones that, like, I can mention that maybe more people haven't seen. But again, working from, like, most mainstream down, because I admit none of these are super not mainstream in um, my examples. But one that I like loved and rewatched over and over again. I don't hear many people mention anymore. Was Shaolin Showdown? Oh yeah, with Tent on Tunic. That's yeah, <laughs> See, like, I knew right away. I love Shaolin Showdown. Yeah, and I know Carl does. And but like, 
Paul's the only really person I've ever mentioned Shaolin Showdown to that's got like popped off for it. I still mention it in videos and people don't get the reference. I'll still mention 10 ton tunics when I'm playing like Revenge. Like, what the fuck's a 10 ton tunics? Like, you need to get on your Shaolin Showdown. That was the show that I always wanted to rewatch. And I, I, like, that was always the one that I would like check the little TV guide thing and be like, oh, tonight Shaolin Showdown's on. I'm going to mark like my part of the TV watching for tonight as like, I've got dibs on TV at like 7 p.m. when Shaolin Showdown's on. And it's like, you know, my sisters can go and watch whatever they want, back, like either side of Shaolin Showdown, but we're watching Shaolin Showdown. I don't remember too many specifics of it, but just like, again, that was something that was a bit more um, kind of like closer towards like the anime inspired side of cartoon network yeah there was that like, yeah that it comes from that era of like anime is kind of popping off how much can we I, I know the other one that people get mad hype for but i just i could never get over how ugly it was is code lyoko like people go mad hype for like french anime code lyoko and it just looks way too but there's people out there who are like obsessed with it because they say like it's art style like people just enjoyed that art style and it's like it's so unique to them and like you know, kind of similar vibes to Shaolin Showdown would be something like Jackie Chan Adventures, where Which again, I watched that one. it felt a bit more anime-inspired side of the cartoons. Um, and it obviously it's not anime, but it, it felt like it was inspired by it. And just, yeah, Jackie Chan Adventures was also just phenomenal. Oh, man, we need to do an episode on Jackie Chan Adventures. <laughs> but again, that's one that people, they fondly recall it. And it's one of those things, it, 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 Jack Chan Adventures could fall into this, of like, you know, it was a good show, well-received at the time, but you never hear anybody talking about it today. But like, when you mention it, people's eyes light up, and that was the idea behind this conversation of, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, it doesn't have to be the most obscure shit in the world, it just has to be something people don't talk about. But you still have a very a fondness for it, because you watched it as a kid. I'm under no illusion that the shit I've mentioned today is of high quality, but I liked it. And I have the ability to acknowledge both of those things. I can simultaneously say, I liked it, but it might not be that good. Like, you could probably do a Shaolin Showdown. Like, it probably wasn't a great show. It, but it I liked it. Was, it was probably, like, a fine cartoon. But for some reason, it really resonated with me. And that was, like, the one for me. There's a reason it's not mentioned too much today. Yes, exactly. Is It probably wasn't overly great and it probably was one of those weird shows of it didn't get good ratings and got like cancelled without an ending or something or like you know just dropped off a cliff in quality or something like that but yeah there's a hundred percent a reason why everyone isn't raving about Shaolin Showdown nowadays. I've got like an honourable mention but my last actual proper example um, is just and it's not necessarily just the singular game but there was a portion of games in my childhood where the multiplayer like spin-off bit that was probably not great and not really the main appeal was like the appeal of it to me. Like the, there's a few examples. Like for example, uh, Pokemon Stadium. The two Pokemon Stadium games I loved. Uh, the mini games like uh, Sonic Adventure Two Battle. Like, for some reason, that awful multiplayer game, I really liked asking people to play that with me. Um, but the, the, like, the more obscure pick that I want to mention that kind of encapsulates that genre of like the bad multiplayer spin-off that for some reason I wanted to play is uh, Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. So I only know this game of seeing the cover in like game and it costing 40 quid and be like, why the fuck would I play that? <laughs> I've never heard of this. Like, Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg is a, just a game where you roll around big eggs and like pop them over bubbles of fruit until they grow big enough that you like shout cook a doodle do at them and then they hatch into animals and then you use those animals to like help you in the platforming challenges and stuff. Okay, I'm on board. It, it, I'm sure it was a solid like, you know, six, seven out of ten. But it was just one of those games that for some reason I was like really obsessed with that and Super Monkey Ball and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle and the GameCube. These weird Sega games that like, I mean, you know, Sonic's always weird, but it's popular. But like just that I always wanted to play like the multiplayer little mini game bit of. 
and there was just like, oh, should we play Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg and play the battle mode and all do like this weird split screen battle mode where you just like kind of quietly roll your egg around on your own for a while and then occasionally you come across each other and kill each other's egg. Isn't that really fun? I, I, like, I was just, if it wasn't forcing Smash Bros down people's throats, I was forcing Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg down <laughs> Did you guys ever make your own mini games within a multiplayer game because you've overplayed it? I remember me and my brother used to play Hide the Bottle in Crash Team Racing because obviously you could uh, lay bottles on the track, um, like banana skins in uh, Mario. You could lay bottles on the track. So we used to play a game where one of us would close our eyes, the other would drive somewhere on the track and lay a bottle tucked into a corner or behind a piece of terrain. Try and find it. You had to play Find the Bottle, yeah. As kids the amount of times we would play like hide and seek in split screen games but they're split screen games so if anyone just wanted to be an asshole, they could just look at your well, that's screen that's why you point it at the wall so you could just see a brick service you're like oh i know you need some bricks but like you do it like so you know you could do it on like mario kart 64 and you'd be on block fort where each of the four forts were colored <laughs> like they were all individually colored so it'd be like well i see this color on your screen and i know which corner of the map you're on what is your honourable mention then, Lucas? My honourable... The fact you're laughing means this is going to be a good one. It's just... It's because how poorly it's aged. Uh, of We had a VHS that was a promo for Disney World. We went to Disneyland Paris a lot. And, you know, we, we went quite a few times as kids and stuff. Um, but we never went to, like, the, the Disney World in America. That was always, like, you know... The dream. The goal. The dream. Yeah. Like, I've still not even been. One day we'll go to Disney World. Like, that's like bigger Disneyland. And we will watch this promo video over and over again. But the thing that hasn't aged well was the backing track. Which is? Can you guess the song that's like super duper cancelled by Disney? It's not going to be one from Song of the South, is it? Is it going to be like... <laughs> Maybe. Is it one from Song of the South? It was Zippity Doodah. No! Uh, and it was like, Wait, is that oh, the one about is that the racist crow oh song? A wonderful day. I, I don't even. I, I'm Wait, pretty that sure it's like one of the super. Yeah, super duper. Is it, is it the racist right? crow song? I'm just going to Google now Song of the South. I just know that song from when I was a kid. I don't know where it came from. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, let's say, again, it was just a happy go lucky song as a kid, right? Zippity Doo Dah is influenced by the chorus of the pre Civil War folk song. A word I'm not gonna say because it's a racial slur. Finding that out as an adult, and I was like, all we did as a kid was like listen to that song as we watched this promo VHS, and we had no clue. I've I've sang that as an adult. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh god. Finding out that this thing that we just obsessively watched as a kid, like one day we'll get to go to Disney World, and it's like, oh, you were just like listening to this awful song in the background. Oh no! Uh, and just yeah, like obviously, like a Disney is not um, super obscure, but I'm sure like not too many people watch like this weird promo for Disney World on the VHS like back in the day. Yeah, I bet as well. There's someone out there who's nostalgic for Song of the South because I think every time it gets mentioned, you always get one person saying, "You know what? It's actually a pretty good film." And I can't believe they're only just replacing the ride based on it. I don't think I've seen Could, Song of the South. No one has, I've not, I've not it, seen it. It was deleted in like the 80s. Yeah, I've not seen it. I've heard about it nowadays. Obviously, it exists. Because of course it exists. But It's bizarre to look back and see like in such a short period of time like how much things have changed. For the better, I'm not one of these people, everything's gone woke. It's like, for the better, to clarify... And it's just like, I can't, I cannot believe stuff like that existed so, like, such a short amount of time ago. Within living memory. Who is that? Not Alleg our living memory not necessarily, us, but, but some, somebody some of was it, around. like, look at fucking mid-2000s comedy, there was a lot of shit about. To move on to a, a maybe hopefully happier note, Brad, what have you got for us? Uh, before we get on to me, uh, I think we mentioned at the start, if it wasn't cut out, we recorded Nisha presenting a few examples so we can talk about them because obviously she can't be with us today. She's unfortunately away on holiday in a, probably a much nicer location than we're currently The in. poor thing. Yeah, that's, that's everyone pour a drink out for Nisha. Um, so we're going to watch now what Nisha said and we're going to put it on for you. This was Nisha's first example. 
So Nisha, how, how is it on holiday in this beautiful location? It's great, yeah, it's warm and holiday -y and uh, <laughs> definitely there right now. Yes, def definitely not a, a green screen. It's gonna be good, it's gonna be good fun and tiring. Even though I'm, gonna, I'm gonna need a break after this break because I'll just be so tired from all the walking and the, the queuing and the rides. So the topic of this month's focus yes. is weird media from your childhood or from the past that has in some way defined who you are or your personality. The thing is, what I find hard about this question is I don't feel like any of the stuff has defined me. Like, the stuff that I've done, like, the stuff that I've seen that's probably influenced some of the stuff that I've done. But I wouldn't say it's like massively defined who I am. I mean, there's one, there's probably one that the closest to defining me is probably when I watched um, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody on Disney Channel. Yeah, uh, when I was younger and I was obsessed with, it was Ashley Tisdale's hair. Right. She plays Maddie, who works at the hotel, and she just had like, kind of like what my hair looks like now actually, because it was blonde. Obviously extensions, fringe, how she had colours in it and everything. And I just wanted her hair and it was just, every, every episode it was done in a different, like elaborate style. And I was like, I always have hair like that now. I mean, I probably didn't realise until recently that my hair looks like hers. So they maybe it's still affecting me, but... So you think I, her hair choice has influenced <laughs> your hair choice in future? Well, I don't know, because like, it's not something I really thought about until now. Like Maybe it has, because I loved it when I was younger, and it's like, maybe now I'm finally getting that hair. That's a really interesting point. I never thought of it from that point of view of it influencing the way you style yourself. Because the reason I have long hair it's because I played Devil May Cry 3 as a kid. <laughs> and I never realised guys could have long hair. And I saw Dante, and Dante's so cool. Dante is so cool. And he has, like, the long hair. And I went, wait, guys can have long hair? So that's, I just started growing my hair out because I thought it looked cool. And I didn't realise it was a style option for guys. The hairstyle I always wanted when I was a kid was uh, I wanted black hair... I want it long at the back, and then I wanted two strands hanging down. And I don't know where that look came from. I don't know exactly where that look came from, but I always remember. Do you remember the film Sky High? Yes. I always like. I know of it, but I haven't watched yeah, it. Yeah. I always liked the way that War and Peace looked. He had like that's that black hair. I think he had sort of a, a long, uh, like a dangling look. <laughs> you, the way that you said that character's name sounded like you said war and peace. That's, that's his name, the joke. His yeah. name is Warren. Oh, okay. Peace. That, yeah, yeah. That's the joke, right? Which is really, which is a really cool name, and it's a shame that it was wasted on Sky High. <laughs> no, Sky High is like like a pretty, you know, it could fall into this category of like it's just a forgotten Disney original. That I I have a, a, a nostalgia for. It. I recommend it. It's on Disney Plus. It's like ninety minutes, and it has like a couple of actors where you'd recognize. It's like Kurt Russell's in it. Yeah, I, I like that though. What Nish said of like uh, stuff you could see as a kid, like influencing the way you choose to style yourself, like your haircuts. I was I was gonna say that I'm pretty sure the reason that for the past fifteen years I've had coloured hair is probably because of animes. Then by the same token, something we've not even touched upon is the idea that the media you consume, sometimes obscure, sometimes not, can influence your tastes. So there's, I think we joked about you know it awoke something within us. That's the joke, isn't it? But I'm pretty sure like everybody out there has that single character they can point to as the first time they felt attraction. Everyone always talks about like the first time they found someone attractive is generally media because you can you see so many more people on your TV than you do in real life. Well, that's an interesting thing. Like, I'm glad that Nisha brought that up because that's something that I and Lucas didn't mention. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I was really into drawing when I was younger. And I used to make my own like comics and stories. And I watched this film, which I think I found it at like a car boot sale or some market. It was like a cheap film and it's called White Fang. And I know there's like quite a few films and TV series called White Fang. But this is one, you can find it on YouTube, but the whole film's on YouTube, it's like 45 minutes long. The whole film? Yes. Um, yeah, obviously 2D animation, but it is the worst animation I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> the songs are terrible, the acting is completely shite, but it made me make my own White Fang story. So I was like, really, I got into drawing, like, I think what helped, what helped me get into drawing comics or stories was that, because I made my own version. 
I love that um, something was so bad that you made your own, and that's that inspired your artistic um, like side of you. I've not watched it for a long time. I kind of want to watch it so just to remember how bad it was. I kind of want to watch it with someone else well, so they can appreciate how bad it is. <laughs> We occasionally do like live streams on the Patreon now, mm -hmm. like a patron exclusive live stream. So would you maybe be interested in going back and watching this old film with me and then maybe Lucas and Cal if they want to join as well? And we can get <laughs> <laughs> we can get people in to watch with us and we can comment on it. Could be a thing. Yeah. So if you're not if you haven't joined the Patreon then you can sign up for that and oh, I'd feel bad though if we were watching it and people were like, actually this is quite good. <laughs> I'm just like Well then you'll yeah, have to yeah. live with your shame forever. But like for me as a kid, when because you, when you're a kid, you you just like you should enjoy things, don't you? Yeah. And you, but when you get old, you think, well, that's actually quite terrible. As a kid, I thought this is terrible. <laughs> so I just feel like it must have been bad for yeah. me as a kid to be like, this is terrible. How? I could do a better job. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. How bad must it have been for a child to be like, I can do this better? So again, that is a fascinating take on the question, which is why I love like fact theme focuses and stuff because, yeah, that's another aspect of like seeing something bad that makes you think i can do better so like, there's so many like stories from people like um, like lucas brad you both made like amateur films when you were a kid right yeah that mm -hmm. must have been inspired by seeing stuff like oh the blair witch project wait i can walk around a woods with a camera and get a movie <laughs> i can do that and it makes sense when you're a kid because i hate that thing when adults go modern art i could do that no but you didn't but it's kind of wholesome when a kid sees it and they realize wait a minute art can look like this i could do that and then they go and do it, and it like you know it inspires a passion, interest. Like Nisha, she's still interested in drawing to this day, because she just saw something shit and went, "Well, I can do it better than that." Because it's the same thing of like kids and adults looking at like you know say like a football match and being like, "Well, I could do that," and it's like for a kid that's like a really inspirational thing. And then when you see like the fifty-year-old man screaming at the television how did they miss that shot from 30 foot out with three defenders and a goalkeeper in the way i could have done that it's like fuck off that's really reminded me when you're talking about um like when they talking about something creating like a passion do you guys ever watch ryan versus dork man is this no this isn't really someone else people out there know what this is ryan versus dork man was one of the winners of the um annual lightsaber fight competition I think they won like four or eight. There used to be this thing online on this Star Wars website where people would make their own lightsaber duels and each year one of them would win. And Ryan vs. Dortman was one of the most popular ones because it went viral. And it went viral around YouTube, it went viral across the internet. And obviously I caught this and this is the first thing that ever was said to me. Oh, people can make visual effects at home. So I went, I looked into it and Ryan Weaver, who's one of the guys who made it, he had a website and on it was a tutorial on how to do lightsabers. I got this software, I learned how to do it, and from that moment on, I started making film. That got me into editing, that got me into visual effects. So we're here today because of that piece of media. It's not something that's not mainstream, um, but I remember back in the day, uh, I got Lord of the Rings Risk. But I got that when I was a kid. I was like, cool, I love Lord of the Rings, and they've given me like little figurines. And me and my friend, who we always play board games together, it's like, we, we started reading this risk thing and it was like, I don't know what's going on here. So we took the figurines, we made our own rule set and it was nothing like risk, but it, it made, we made it work for us. Like I still enjoy doing that to this day. And like we made a bunch of board games together because of that. And like, even now as an adult that I like, you know, I don't want to say too much about it, but like, you know, I still have like an idea that I am, working on and trying to balance a rule set for nowadays as an adult of like oh but i've got a cool idea for a board game that like one day maybe i'll could concede to completion maybe i won't but like even now what 20 plus years later that thing has still got that spark in my brain of like making board games it is interesting right that's why i've like enjoyed this so much because obviously different people have different bits of feedback like when you ask a question like that it's open-ended the answers you get aren't always what you'd expect and i really appreciate nisha's answers being so um uh, different to what ours were so far fortunately we, we can't spend too long with nisha's but if she was here we'd be able to have like that back and forth we can only respond to like you know a minute long video <laughs>
Because I would love to break down more of what she like thought about that, because that's a really interesting um, take on the topic. Also, if I put my hand in my pocket, it looks like I'm touching my knob, so... Each one of these things that we've been talking about as well just starts a new discussion about that very specific aspect. Like, we could have made this even more narrow and said what media from your childhood influenced your future careers, or that kind of thing. Like, I, I said that Ryan versus Dorkman, some silly lightsaber skit online made me into an editor. In reference to that, the reason that I think I got so obsessed with facts, because people are probably thinking, like, I only talked about video games, my interest is in media, which is my real passion. Like, you know, that I do in my spare time. But my job-wise, it'd be, I got those book binders as a kid, again, given to us by relatives who just had them, and it was just various reference textbooks that they'd have, like, on bugs, dinosaurs, ancient Egypt, all that sort of thing. Just, like, those big bind... Ooh, sorry. Those big binders full of, like, facts about something, and I just endlessly pour over those and annoy my friends and family with, like, did you know? I did like video games, but the fact that I even just remembered, like, we made up our own rules for, like, Pokemon games, and I made up rules for, like, how to make Yu-Gi-Oh better and stuff, and, like, the fact that then I went on to, like, study game design and stuff is, like, maybe the video games weren't the necessarily the influential part of that, it was more the fact that even from like 10 years old, I was like, well, I know how to make Yu-Gi-Oh better than Yu-Gi-Oh made it and start making up my own rules. Yeah, you had the thought to, um, you wanted to get involved with the creation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that when you just said that then, I was like, oh yeah, like I've never considered that, but that's probably a big influence. Yeah. That's why it's so fun to look back on this sort of thing. Because a lot of people, when they have nostalgia, think, oh, that was nice. But they don't sit down and really break down what it is they liked about it. And that's why it can lead to, hopefully, such interesting discussions. Like the one we're about to have with Brad about stuff that he remembers. So while I've been talking, I just I made a couple of notes of things I just wanted to bring up when I, my, my turn came around. Um, of just things like, did you know these things? Do you remember these things? One of them, Nisha and I talked about this when we were talking about what ideas she wanted to submit. Did you guys ever watch Spice World or play the game? Oh, we talked we, about the podcast that's coming out today on Wiki Weekends is about Spice Girls yes. slash Spice World. There you like, go. Today is in the day that we're recording, right? We we're recording. recording it, yes. Yeah, so, so I'll put a link in the know, description for that. That's the that's yeah. Um, go check that out. Yeah, it's the twenty seventh we're recording this, so that'll be last week's last Wednesday's. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, all right. Well, we'll leave that discussion for there then. Um, another one that I was reminded of was a TV show that I was obsessed with called The Mole. And it only ran for two seasons. And it recently got brought back, I think, on Netflix. But it's shit because it's over-dramatised. It's clearly like um, they've exaggerated a bunch of stuff to try and make it seem more dramatic. When it's... Uh, back then it was like... It was so real. And um, The Mole was... Uh, I can remember the opening um, spiel. It was 10 complete strangers must work as a team to win a prize of up to £200,000. But one of them is the Mole, a traitor, an insider, a saboteur. Um, the winner, the one who can answer the question, who is the Mole? I did watch that Netflix series. Yeah, yeah no, and... the Netflix one is awful. Like The original one was a British one like two decades ago. I'm sure like it probably is worse, but for someone who doesn't have any comparison, like I did find it a really interesting watch even on the Netflix version. And... It was super dramatized for sure, but like, I love the hoops that people will jump through to be like, oh no, but like, I, to to be not suspicious, I've got to act suspicious and therefore make us lose a bunch of money. And there was one person that like threw away like half of the available money to be an asshole. Maybe I didn't give it enough time. Maybe I should go back and try and watch it. The one for me. It's got to be it's um, uh, Golden Balls. Oh, yes. Because that's the one where you basically you win money, like any quiz show. But the gimmick is, at the end, you get to choose whether you can steal all the money for yourself. Oh, yeah. And if you both choose to steal, no one gets anything. But if one person chooses to share and the other chooses to steal, they get it all. If they both choose to share, they split it. And, the amount of, and they give them like 30 seconds to convince each other they're not going to steal. And just you have the moments where it's like, well, we've got, we've got 10 grand, that's five grand each. I can take my kids on holiday. You can take your kids on holiday. That's perfect, right? So yeah, perfect. Shake hands, steal. And like <laughs> the, the fact that fist fights never broke out on that show is impressive. Because if I was there, like someone shook my hand, someone shook my hand and said, we'll split it. And then they went back on that. 
I would lamp them on the spot. You would have me, like, the, it would cut to black as I leapt over that desk. It's, it's so painful to watch people's faces when they realise that they'd been fair, they'd split like they'd agreed, and the other person steals, and it's like... The, uh, or the amount of times where, like, the legendary clips that come out of it, just the, so those moments, or the moments where both of them were doing that thing, and they both go for steel, and they, I thought we had an agreement, man. What the fuck? And then it's like, but you did the same thing. They get mad at each other for not be, for also <laughs> lying. It's like, what the fuck? Now we don't get anything. It's like, <laughs> you also stole. Uh, but back to the mall. It, this was this show was a lot more intricate than people. I, I I had no idea when I first watched it how in depth it got. And like, obviously, if anyone could track it down and watch it, then. They can um, experience this, but if if you if you want to hear any like I guess spoilers for the show, if you want to go and find it, then don't listen to this next bit. But what they would do is like in the final episode when you found out who the mall was, they would go back and they would be like, "Here are the clues that the audience missed." In the in one of the episodes, the bottle of water that they had, the brand was the surname of the person who it was. Like the locations they went to were linked to the person it was, and like there were so many tiny clues. A big thing, I, I really love these kind of games that get, like, in-depth and there's loads of, like, extra hints and things like ARGs and, like, real-life sort of... And I, I feel like that must have come from them all. This show that was, like... this On surface level, it's a very simple premise. It's just Among Us, where everybody works together to do tasks, one person tries to ruin the task, have to try and guess who that person is. But then when you pull back and they're like, no, you missed all of these different clues, like, even the individual um, tasks would occasionally be based around pointing at who the person is. I am a person that really enjoys those kind of like social deduction games of like things like The Mole. And I think that's why, um, you know, over the past few years, like Among Us has really popped off because it's like just trying to sit there and kind of put together the pieces of like who's lying, who's telling the truth. And then, you know, you'll get people like me who sometimes do and sometimes don't like to just be the wild card because fuck other people and like pretend as if they're suspicious and you get things like that that you can't take into account of like how are other people going to act under this scenario it's like everyone's not going to necessarily just play their role straight because i think we all recall that moment like i think me and you used to play in lockdown didn't we and i think we just stopped playing among us because there were people who'd min max the shits out of it where they'd be like um, immediately call a meeting second one of okay um carl's the imposter is that why because i've got this selection of tasks and he walks in the direction that means he hasn't got one so he's the imposter and it's like well how do you argue against that i've watched like you know x and y videos of how to break down every single task and i know exactly what's going on it's like well that's not fun anymore because you've taken the the social deduction out of the social deduction game i joined in with a group of people who were playing it for the first time and one of them was just like if we all just walk around together the entire time then we'll get all the tasks done the person can't do anything and they did we did that for like two or three games and then they were like this isn't fun it's like yeah because you made it not fun <laughs> I think that the mole, um, mostly, that that's influenced the way that I like, like the kind of games that I like to make or play. Like right now, we're talking about it, in my mind. I'm like, I need to make this in Minecraft. I never thought about it before, but if I got a server of people together, I could literally do them all in Minecraft. Because like I've been watching a lot of uh, Hermitcraft um, over the past few years, and uh, obviously you guys won't know anything about this really. But uh, Tango Tech has made a basically a, a, a little mini game within. A survival Minecraft called Decked Out and it's this intricate game that's going to be running on that server for like 10 weeks plus and watching this is like I want to make a game I want to make games like this I love making games and I think a lot of that comes all the way back to this series that like, I remember the opening monologue I remember the music I can picture the episodes and the people in it because we had it on VHS and I would watch it back and forth like when I say had it on VHS it was recorded we recorded every episode with a VHS player so I could go back and watch it. Because you're going back and watching it a second time and you know who the mole is. It's so much more interesting because you can watch them sabotaging it in front of your eyes. Yeah, no, so I, I have one more example and this is the one that first came to mind when the topic came up. And uh, we were talking earlier about the VHSs that you just have knocking around and you just, you've happened to have watched because they're there. And I've brought this film up multiple times with people and nobody has ever heard of it. This film is called... Alaska. 
Have either of you seen Alaska? Nope. Right, so, so I've intentionally not looked up anything about this film because I remember nothing about it except for the fact that two kids go on an adventure with a polar bear. But the reason why I bring this up is because polar bears are my favourite animal. And that's the reason why. Because we had a film where a polar bear cub was in it and I loved it. And like, on my shelf behind, there's a little polar bear plush you can see. Sat there. I've just looked up the, uh, the like, the film and seen the VHS cover of just like these two kids with mountains in the background and then just like the derpiest little looking <laughs> pole yeah. over. So I'm going, I'm going to look it up now and I'm going to read the synopsis and I just I have, I have no idea what this film is about and I think at some point I might have to watch it maybe do a commentary track. So okay, so Alaska is a 1996. So uh, I'd have seen this when I was five if we got it when it came out. American adventure survival film directed by Fraser Clark Heston and produced by Carol Fuchs and Andy Berg. The story written by Berg and Scott Meyer centers on two children who search through the Alaskan wilderness for their lost father. During their journey, they find a polar bear who helps lead them to their father. However, a poacher with a desire to capture the bear follows close behind the children and the polar bear. Wait, Charlton Heston's in it? <laughs> what you say is when you look back at there's always those like weird kids movies. Like we talk like Sky High, like Kurt Russell is in it. Alaska was a box office bomb. Of course, it, of course it was. It's called Alaska. <laughs> but I am wondering now, I I love survival games in the snow. Like, that's a big thing. I always, I play The Long Dark. I've played um, The Wild Eight. I've played uh, various other survival games. Like, one of my, my favourite kind of game at the moment is survival games. Maybe it came from Alaska. It might have done. My nan still got the VHS. I just saw it when I was back there most recently on the shelf. And I was like, oh my god. That's why I, I know that's why I like polar bears. Because though I think the polar bear in it is called Cubby. And my first hamster was named Cubby. When I used to play games, when I was when you were a kid and you play games, you pretend to be an animal. I always pretended to be a polar bear. I remember where I went to the zoo a few years back. It was the first time I'd seen a live polar bear and I was really excited about it. Like, I love polar bears. And clearly that film, and a part of me is like, do I want to watch it? Because I'm, I'm going to ruin it for myself. I am going to ruin it. 100% do not recommend watching it again. Yeah, I would recommend you keep it as a memory. Don't go back, because you'll ruin that memory, and then you won't be able to get it back. That's the kind of thing where it's like, it's this unknown movie that's like 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. It's a very middling movie, and you have warm feelings for it being a good movie. It's not the same as, for example, when I'm like, I'm going to like watch... Mighty Morphin Power Rangers because I know that that's a shit show and it's going to be fucking hilarious. It's like you genuinely have warm emotions towards it. I would just leave it where it is in your childhood. I like how I can see the thought process in your brain. Of, I know that you're right, but also fuck you. I want to go watch it. <laughs> Maybe I'll yeah. put it to a vault sometime in the future. <laughs> well, this... should I should I destroy a core memory from my childhood for the band <laughs> for the for the content? I feel like that may that be a nice place to round off, though the like the idea of um, a piece of media from your childhood, like the way you remember it, is sometimes better than the media itself. And you do go back sometimes and watch them, like oh, I used to love this thing, and realize like Power Rangers. You just mentioned I went back and watched the first season of Power Rangers again. It's fucking shite. Like I love it for nostalgic reasons, but it's so bad. Everything about it is awful. Me and you can go back and watch, all of us can go back and watch Power Rangers because we have nostalgia for it. If you showed it to someone who's no familiarity with the series and no affinity for it, they'd be like, this is wank. Like, what, why, this is so stupid, why the fuck would you watch this? That's a conversation for another day. Because that's... But, yeah, hopefully people enjoyed this one about just discussions of... I forgot what it was about now. You know, meet her obscure media, maybe it's, it's obscure to you, like, as Lucas described, or just obscure media in general. Um, that influenced the person you ended up being today. So let us know in the comments what you know that media is for you and how it influenced you or the way you think or the way you act, the way you dress, um, the way you live and love. I guess now we're going to do the, the Patreon shout out as well because this video episode is made possible by our Patreons. The people in uh, some of our tiers, like they get to vote on the topic, which uh, was voted on. This was Carl's topic, but we all suggest one every month. And uh, yeah, we're going to be reading out now the names of our patrons on our VIP tier. Um, so I guess, Carl, do you want to take us away? 
Yes, uh, so we'll go to the start with. So yeah, once again, thank you for watching this. We'll have another fact fee focus next. And the reason it's so long as well is because, yeah, if we only do this once a month, we can sit down and have a nice long ass conversation. If we were doing this every week, it'd be about shorter. I mean, speaking of the length as well, actually, uh, we've been recording for two hours and this will likely be an hour long video. So if you want to watch the full extended cut of this, which will be happening every single time, there'll be a longer cut. That will also only be available to Patreon, uh, to patrons on Patreon. I get it wrong every time as well. Patrons such as, so hopefully I can pronounce all these correctly. So if I do mispronounce the name, um, go yell at me on Patreon. Uh, so we have Jet Road, Aaron Clausen, Countessa, Erica Toledo, Lousy Shisha, Beriet N. Uranus, Dan Daly, My Shoe Hurt 69. That's a good one. Litigation hyphen Santa Claus, Kynan Plays Games, Mr. Bad Boy Patch, Sean Watson, Benjamin Fridman, CD Bad, The Wizard of Wonders. Thank you also to Darth Turkey28, Amy Brundridge, G, I like that, just G, <laughs> yeah. Michelle Holloman, Grim Baker, uh, Patrick Bratson, Robert, 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 this is a tough one to say. Uh, Kester Stutz, Anna Goo, Umbrella Ortano, Kelleran, Doug Schnuglis. That's a good That's a tougher one to Goo, say. Doug Schnuglis. <laughs> uh, Hannan DOA Argov, uh, Rotoscope, and Taylor Brandwood. Uh, big thank you as well to Anixia, uh, Thani Syed Al Ramethi, Susan from South Africa, Binger. Zirin King, Jubjub366, AeroQC, Nesta Aylman, Ryan Ryder, Sam Bartram, Andy Roffel, Popsicle Tart, Deadpool, De Deadpool for Boobies, Shea Pinder, Lyndon B. Johnson, Carl, do you want to I guess. finish up? I guess, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll finish up, so I'll take Nisha's place here. So we have... Uh... Bringing up the rear, um, so last but not least, we have uh, Brina Lawless, The Boy Lambert, Impy, Sloan Rockefeller, Bubba P, Fioro, or Fiora Lily, Andy Ellis, Harrison Rupp, Chibisa Matueri, Tyler Mason, Jacob Ersenbach, Joshua Knapp, Seri Paul, Coffee Soap, Ian Lures, Stefan Silva Wolf. We always think, like, I, I, I guess you guys are the same. Hey, oh, yeah, just reading some names, that'll be easy enough. But, <laughs> uh, like, obviously those names could be anything. You know, some of them trying to read them off the cuff is, it, you're like, wait, that threw me for a loop. Yeah. But, yeah, thank you all to, you know, just all of our supporters out there. And thank you for the shout-out support as well. Yes, and you can follow us on Patreon for more like this and to vote on uh, the next... Uh, fact theme focus that we do, the subjects of which we need to decide when Nisha gets back. So we'll all be suggesting our own topic, and you can go vote on it on Patreon when we do. It's all just going to be Spice World. <laughs> Four different <laughs> variations of Spice World. <laughs>